You know, we've been looking at these Psalms of Ascent as a model of Christian discipleship, and today we're going to do that through David's life to see what we can glean from this. David was the youngest of eight, the last child of an aging father. He was out watching his father's sheep when the aged prophet came, anointing oil in hand, seeking Israel's future king. David didn't know what he was doing until a cry from a servant hailed him. Hey, David, Samuel's here, and your father wants you to come. Arriving home, Samuel beckoned to him, and kneeling at Samuel's feet, David felt warm oil poured over his head, a blessing spoken over him. And even though the faces of his brothers and even his father were probably questioning, there wasn't any doubt in Samuel, and there would later be no doubt in David that God had indeed called him to holy purposes. Do you know you're called to holy purposes? David sensed the Holy Spirit come over him in power then, and he knew that life would never be the same. Now, as to all that meant and all that when it would take place, there was absolutely no word, and there really didn't appear to be a way, because Israel already had a king. Imagine that. King Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, so not only was David not of that royal tribe, he wasn't a royal line, he wasn't even of that tribe. So is there is this question of how are you gonna do that, Lord? But King Saul suffered greatly from demonic oppression. His counselors recognized the problem, oh, that we would recognize the problem, suggested that a harpist be sought whose music would soothe Saul's troubled mind. And guess what David just happened to be? He was a harpist. As he set out in the fields, he would strum that harp, and he would write some of those beautiful psalms that we sing. He was the perfect one to step into that place, was he not? And in that way, he came to be part of the king's service. It was a start. David's playing pleased Saul greatly, and he promoted him to armor bearer. I'm still not quite sure how those two things fit. But David was left at home when Israel went to war with the Philistines, while his three older brothers followed Saul to the battle. They were part of the army of Israel who gathered every morning to hear Goliath, that Philistine champion, Call out their cowardice. Now, you know that story, right? But when David heard Goliath blaspheme the name of the Lord, the presence of the Lord came upon him in power and might, and he ran to the battle, trusting that the Lord would do what he would, had done before and that he would defeat that enemy. Well, victory was his, right? And victory continued battle after battle. David never went back to tending his father's sheep. Saul made him a high-ranking officer. David's friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan, grew. Saul's daughter, Michael, was given to him as a wife. And it appeared that that future for which Samuel had anointed David might come about somehow through natural causes. And then it all fell apart. Anybody ever been in that place? Yeah. Yeah. One day as Israel returned from battle triumphantly, Saul overheard not his praises sung, but David's, and jealousy overtook him. And he tried um, then several times to kill David until David had no choice but to flee, leaving everything behind. Now, can you imagine you don't have a home, you don't have any status, you don't have any position, it appears that you have no direction, and there's nobody around you to help. Can you imagine what David felt like? It's all gone up in flames. You can't possibly do this. Now what? Maybe you felt that way. Well, David fled first to Samuel, who happened to be still alive. And when Saul attempted to capture him in that place, the Spirit of the Lord captured Saul, and he fell to the ground prophesying. Can you imagine this man who's after you, chasing, and all of a sudden he falls to the ground, and all he can do is shout the, the glories of God, even while he's thinking murderous thoughts about David. I just find that greatly ironic. He was not allowed to touch David at that time. Later, David ran to Ahimelech the priest, who gave him bread and Goliath's sto- uh, sword, which for some reason had been stored there. That's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture that I can find. I wonder what it was doing there. Oh my, it must have been that David would need it. Imagine that. Now here's the sad part of this. Ahimelech and his entire family were wiped out by Saul, who accused them of assisting this rebel, David. Can you imagine feeling responsible for that kind of loss? Ard, how can this be? 
One son, Abiathar, managed to escape. And with nowhere to turn, Abiathar sought out David, bringing with him the ephod of the high priest, that garment that contained the means of discerning the Lord's will. And in that way, that ephod came into David's hands. And so he had it to inquire, Lord, what do you want me to do? David inquired of the Lord um, from then on in that, well, from, David inquired constantly of the Lord the rest of his life. Joined by 400 misfits and rebels, he attacked the fringes of Israel's land. And during that time, he freed Israel from all of her enemies in that place, even as Saul and the armies of Israel chased after him. Can you imagine being able to maintain that kind of focus in the midst of a trial like that? Twice King Saul was left vulnerable and exposed, but David refused to kill him, and he chose instead to wait on the Lord rather than taking matters into his hand because the Lord had car will carry out his promises for David. You know we don't have to make those happen, right? Yeah, remember what happened when Abraham and Sarah tried to make that happen. It did not end up well. We don't want to be in that place. David knew that story. He didn't want to be in that place either. Both times he called out to Saul, asking that Saul recognize his loyalty. He said, I mean you no harm. And each time Saul affirmed that to be true, promising that he would not harm David. You know, if only Saul could see that, perhaps David could be reinstated. And then those purposes for David's life could be set back in place. But it wasn't to be that way. No. After 13 years of running from Saul, David knew that Saul could not be trusted. And so he took his small army and he moved to Philistine land where they continued to work on Israel's behalf from a safe place. And then one fateful day, the Philistines purposed to attack Israel. David and his men were asked to accompany them, but God intervened. The Philistine leaders were fearful of betrayal and they did not want David and his men to fight with them. And in that way, David and his men were saved from harming their own and from harming the destiny that God had for David. He's a good God, isn't he? David and his men turned back toward home. When they arrived, they found that their city had been burned to the ground and everyone within, their wives, their children, their servants, had been taken captive. So not only is this a fruitless battle that they're not able to fight, they go back home and find such incredible loss. Exhausted from those travels and now in a place of deep mourning, David's own men turn against him. They want to stone him. Any lesser man would give up, but not David. David found strength in one place. You know where he found it? Where was it? He found it in the Lord, and he rose to inquire of him, Shall we pursue him? Yes. Will we overtake them? Yes. And so David and his men set out. They caught up with the raiding party and recovered every single thing. No captive had been harmed, none killed. Everything that was taken was restored to him, and even greater plunder was taken from that raiding party. Now here's the good thing that came of it. David sent that plunder to the leaders of his own tribe, Judah, and he sent some to every place that he and his men had roamed over those 13 years. Those gifts reminded them of all that David had done for Israel during that time. And when word came that King Saul and his sons had fallen in battle, it was to David that they turned just as God promised. King of Judah, later king of all Israel, battle after battle was won as the Lord directed his steps until finally David and his men took the city of Jerusalem, the place that David would call home. David came to realize when his enemies built a palace for him that the Lord had done exactly what he said he would do. Yeah. Now, I want you to think for just a moment what David faced to get to that place. Because sometimes we think when the Lord directs it, it's just going to be a cakewalk. And if something interferes, it can't be of God. But think what David faced. They were unjust accusations. 
rejection, the constancy of running from someone who wants to kill you, the loss of everything that would be important to you and I. So many places in his life that could have made him doubt that God's promises would ever come to fruition. And yet he persevered. Why? David dared believe what God had said. I want to say that again. David dared believe what God said. Because he believed, there's a record of God's faithfulness. And we can see God's presence work continually in David's life. All of those things that culminated in those promises that he made to him came together as David persevered, trusted in God, and believed that they would be. And when we come to this psalm, those pilgrims are standing in that very place that existed because David believed and obeyed God. (laughs) The prayers that are prayed are based on David's covenant with God. God, will you make this your resting place? And you hear God thunder, I will. God, will you clothe your priests with righteousness? I will. God, may your saints ever sing for joy. Yes, they will. And embedded in this psalm are hints of the collective stories of God's people, a history of how he has led them over the centuries and how he has indeed carried out and fulfilled his promises. Do you think he will do it again? Arise, O Lord, was the cry of Israel as they watched the pillar of cloud rise, beckoning to those in the wilderness to follow him to that place he'd prepared for them. The fields of Jaar and the mention of that ark reminded them of another journey, the journey of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. That ark represented the holy presence of God and the place from which he would offer forgiveness to Israel. David wanted to bring that ark to, to Jerusalem. It had rested in Kiriat Jerim, which is another name for Jar, for 50 years. And one glorious day, David and 30,000 of his men set out to bring that ark to its final resting place. Placing it on a new ark, they danced and celebrated like crazy men as they headed for Jerusalem until one of the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah, who was a priest walking alongside that ark of God reached out to stabilize it, and he was struck dead on the spot. That wild party ended in anger and confusion because they did not understand how it could be that they wanted to honor God and that that had happened. You know that answer. Three months later, having recognized that there was a way to bear the ark of God's holy presence, The priests consecrated themselves, they dressed in linen, and together they bore the Ark of the Covenant home to Jerusalem. Everyone in Israel knew that story too. It was part of their history with God. Is it part of ours? This God who has a way? And why are these things important to us? That's a great question. This is not a new faith that we share. It's not one we're making up as we wander through a wilderness. This is a faith that has been handed down to us. To us, There is a record in it of a God who is faithful, who lives in relationship with his people, of a God who purposes and promises good and fulfills those promises in and through those who dare believe him. Is that you? Yes, yes Lord, let it be. <laughs> The last part of this psalm is written specifically to encourage us today, delivered to us via the history of God's interaction with his people in the past. These are the promises of God for us through this psalm. I'll make a horn grow for David. That means David's line is going to continue and God will grant that one through whom it will continue strength and power. Who is that? Thank you. I will set up a lamp for my anointed one. Who's the light of the world from David's line? I will clothe his enemies with shame, but the crown on his head will be resplendent. It will blossom. Hmm. That too is Jesus, but let's get there. (laughs) That's another one of those stories. It comes from number 17. See, Israel is still out wandering in the wilderness here when some of her tribal leaders rebel 
against the leadership of Moses and Aaron. And they challenged them, saying, in essence, who do you think you are? We're just as good as you are. We're just as holy as you are. Well, the Lord shows up, and he shows them who's in charge. He says, take a staff from a leader of each tribe. Set it in the tent of meeting. And in the morning, I'm going to cause the staff of my chosen leader to sprout. Well, Aaron's staff was used to represent the tribe that he and Moses were from, the tribe of Levi. And in the morning, his staff had not only sprouted, but it had produced blossoms and it had borne fruit. God made his choice of leaders absolutely unmistakable. Psalm 2 prophesies that that same thing is going to happen in the future. The whole world is going to act in the same manner. They're going to rebel against God. and They're going to rebel against it with his ways. They're going to attempt to set up their own leaders in their own ways. And God will respond. At some point in the future, he will make his chosen leader absolutely unmistakable. Who is that leader? We got to keep our eyes on him, don't we, church? So how do we apply this thing to our lives today? Well, individually, you know that answer. God has purposes and plans for each of you that as you believe and walk in those ways, he's going to carry those things out. That doesn't mean that you are never going to hit obstacles. It doesn't mean that you're never going to suffer loss. It doesn't mean that it's going to look like a dead end at some point in your life. It does mean you got a faithful God that every time you hit one of those, you can stand and you can inquire of the Lord, what do you want me to do, Lord? And he will give you an answer because he's faithful, isn't he? I know you know that. What does it mean to us as a church? There is a way to bear that presence of God. He's told us how to do it. It's his way. And we have to to step into that place of where we recognize that he is a holy God, that he has a way. It's that way that if we follow, then like those priests in that procession, we're going to get right to our destination, that place that he has promised through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, there's no better guarantee than that which we've seen, a faithful God who will be faithful into eternity. Is he the one you count on today? See, it's in his name that we can pray and watch for those things to be. As we prepare to close this morning, I want to pray in his name. I'm going to ask you to sit for just a moment and can consider what we've talked about, and then we'll pray together. Can you do that? All right, let's pray.